for uh, coming tonight. Um, as you know, we're here to celebrate uh, Mike Metzger's uh, retirement from the IDA and from from everything, actually. He's all done. Yeah, he's all done. But uh, also, we're here to celebrate the uh, the IDA and, and the Tarp Skunks. And um, but Mike um, Mike's played a crucial role uh, at the IDA. He's he was on the IDA board for over two decades and was the chairman since 2008. And so he really helped us through um, some ups and downs and uh, has been a steady hand all those years. You know, he uh, before he even started with the IDA, he worked at, I, I want to say, Bausch and Laum and uh, Accurite, Blackstone Nay, and at SUNY Fredonia, uh, always in a, a, a fiscal role. And so he came to us with a lot of experience, but, um, you know, Mike's respected by uh, the entire community. He's been, a, he's been uh, really active in a lot of different roles throughout the community and um, is, is, is um, again respected by all so Mike congratulations I was gonna I was gonna bring an engraved chainsaw but I don't think it was in our our budget that's kind of a oh well anyway uh, but congratulations Mike and, and thank you you're a great man and uh, really gonna miss you thank you Mike. thanks Thank you. And now uh, we got a bonus. Bonus. You may or may not know that Mike Metzger's son-in-law works for the Milwaukee Brewers. Mike Metzger wears Milwaukee Brewers on his chest, his underwear. Everything is Brewers, Brewers, <laughs> Brewers blue. And in order, we thought to make it appropriately uh, a fun to honor Mike Metzger that we have reached out and had the opportunity, it's been a privilege, to have as our guest tonight, Tom Tellman. Tom Tellman is a Warren, Pennsylvania native, but most importantly, he was in the big show. He was with the San Diego Padres, the Milwaukee Brewers, and ultimately ended up with the Oakland Athletics, and has been a superlative pitching coach, and in fact, was the pitching coach for Christian Dolce. And he threw a no-hitter when I had him. And that's right, because, and as a result, Tom taught him well, and now he's our general manager here. So Tom, if I could come forward, we're gonna tell some war stories, because uh, he's really good. And while he's walking up, one of the things we learned is his favorite player when he was uh, growing up was a, the Minnesota Twins Hall of Famer, Carmen Killebrew, who wore number three, and this is a tarp skunk number three, because I know you always wanted to have and wear a tarp or a three, no doubt a tarp skunk three. So that's yeah. for, for you, Tom. And uh, yeah. Thank you. in addition, uh, we have a hat, Tom, and uh, hopefully it will fit. Uh, it's, it's, it's the Richard Dixon. Uh, actual, because Rich is wearing a similar thing right there. So that's, when, when time permits, you can also have it. Have a seat, Tom. Have a seat, and I'm going to give him the mic because nobody really wants to hear me. However, one of the things I want to do is that we got this on film. We got Scott Kinberg covering this because there is a magic moment in all of this, Tom. And, and the fact that uh, we're going to learn just a couple of highlights because I've uh, I've known some of his stories and the story he's going to lead off with because it's so appropriate for a buffet meal is uh, the Gaylord Perry story. So if you could lay that out here and say, and believe me, they could. There, some may blush, but it's okay. It's okay. Joseph, how are you doing? Joey Mistretta, the legend. Joey, all right, Joey. Good, <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? He was my assistant in war. Joey, good to see you. Yeah. Met him in 1978, was it? 79 in uh, yeah. Arizona Western? Yuma, Yuma, Arizona. 
Genesee beer and chicken wings. He's in the combo. He's down in the bullpen. Wait a minute, man. He says, the only place I know that has Genesee beer and chicken wings is where I'm from. So I told him where I was from and we hit it off. Yeah, I, I used to steal bats and batting gloves and shoes and stuff and give them to him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think he swung Dave Winfield's bat, though, as well as Dave did, because it was probably 35, 37 inches. <laughs> but, but anyway, getting back to the Gaylord Perry story, uh, this had to be June 1979. Uh, I was in Hawaii at the time. I made it to the last day of spring training, and uh, Mickey Lolish, who was pitched... Uh, won three games in a 68 series. He was my roommate in spring training and he had a guaranteed contract, it was his last year. So it came down between me and Mickey and, and they weren't gonna pay me and Mickey both. So I went back to AAA. But Steve Nura, one of the starting pitchers, he hurt his arm and was gonna be on the 15 day DL so I got called up. So uh, being in Hawaii, we normally played at 7.30, games got over 10.30 or so. So I had to leave Hawaii at 10.30 at night, fly to five and a half hours to the coast, a couple of layovers. I got to Chicago about 15 minutes before the game started. They didn't even tell me where Wrigley Field was. <laughs> at the airport, I had to hail a taxi and tell them to take me to Wrigley Field. So I get there and uh, we played, uh, Kingman hit one out and I got hit in the, I was, I was guarding the, uh, pitcher was warming up in the bullpen and I had to guard the catcher from getting in the back and I took a line drive took a line drive in the arm <laughs> trying to protect him but anyway the game is over and, and I just couldn't believe I was in the big leagues I had this game called all-star baseball when I was a kid and the scoreboard was underneath the game you took the scoreboard out put the game board back in and then you set the scoreboard up in the back uh, back of the box and it had a picture on it of, of uh, us, the scoreboard in center field. And I thought it was just an artist's rendering of a, uh, of, of a major league ballpark. And when I got dressed to come out to the, to the field, I walked down the tunnel. And when I stepped up onto the dugout steps and looked out, that scoreboard that I grew up with was the scoreboard of Wrigley Field. And I, I, I could not believe it. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. <laughs> So anyway, we played the game. I can't remember if we won or lost or not, but in my exuberance, and I was dead dog tired. I hadn't slept because I flew all night, got the game. So I go in the locker room and, and in the big leagues, they had a big, you know, they have four or five buffet tables and all kinds of food. And we didn't get that in the minor leagues. So I went in, I rushed in, I took a shower real quick and I dried off and, and not even thinking, I walked right up to the dinner table and started filling my plate up and, they, and I, I, I forgot to put clothes on. <laughs> so standing at the dinner table, buck naked, and Gaylord Perry yelled out to him and he goes, Hey Rook, there's no dangling at the dinner table. <laughs> And, and that was my first, my second. The scoreboard was the first memory, Gaylord was my second. So hang, hang on to that. Along those Gaylord Perry lines, you were, you were telling me one time that he did in fact use gel and other stuff to, to sort of uh, grease up. Uh, and so I think it was a contract that he signed that uh, there was he would not play at certain ballparks. And the ballpark was tiny. And the, the, the wind was always blowing out the right 30 miles an hour. The average game was 18 to 15 in spring training. And if you were a young guy trying to make the team and you had to pitch there, forget it. I mean, you always gave up five or six runs. And basically, you weren't a prospect the next day. But uh, we had a split squad that day. When I was with San Diego, we were playing the Brewers. It was before I got to Milwaukee and got familiar with the park. So anyway, we get to we get to some, some city stadium, and somebody walks up to Gaylord and he said, "So and so's got a sore arm today." He said, "I hate to do it to you, but you're going to have to pitch." And he was fuming because he had it in his contract that he was not to pitch at Sun City in spring training. So he goes out to the mound and and he's got two balls, 
laying on the right in front of the rubber there, and he comes down and he's just bitching and moaning and complaining the whole way down. And <laughs> he stretches a little bit and starts taking his warm up pitches. And, and he had big, huge, slow mechanics as it was. And he's throwing, he throws for about five, seven minutes. And he went back and sat down for a second and had a few more choice words to say about having to pitch that day. Finally broke a sweat, got up, went back to the mound again, and uh, he starts warming up again. He goes, oh, I ain't got that one. And then he throws a couple more, and I ain't got that one. So he puts his glove down, he walks over to his coat, takes out a big tube of KY jelly, and puts it all over his face and back of his neck. Because when he threw, if you ever watched Gaylord pitch, he always did all this stuff while he, he was pitching and then he would throw. And he put that KY jelly all over his face, dried his hands off, went back up to the mound and did his thing and the first pitch he threw, boom, right off the table. He goes, well, I got that one. <laughs> and he went out and he threw three shutout innings and uh, was a happy man when it was all over. So while you were in, in San Diego though, you played with the likes of, of Raleigh Finger, Ozzie Smith, uh, and Raleigh Finger, of course, it traditionally had a look on his, his face, had that look. Can you explain all that? Well, I don't know. Uh, well, the Oakland won it in 72, 73, and 74. And I don't know if Raleigh had the mustache. He did. did he have the mustache in 72? Because his rookie card, he doesn't have it. And it's a good thing he grew it. <laughs> if you look at his baseball card without it. So anyway, and, and I, there's an old guy at the uh, Legion in Warren, and uh, I've given him some Raleigh memorabilia, and I was looking through all of Raleigh, Raleigh's cards, and it's funny because the handle mark mustache was bent differently every year. Sometimes it came down real low, and sometimes it was real high. But the best... The best story was in 84, after my first year in Milwaukee, I bought a home with an indoor swimming pool. And after two or three games uh, in, in our initial homestand, I had a housewarming party and everybody had to bring a bottle of booze because the house had a 48-foot indoor swimming pool. Wow. And I wanted to swim in the off season, keep my shoulders strong and stuff. So everybody comes to the party, they all bring a bottle of booze because there was a bar in where the pool was. And they had been there, everybody had had a few cocktails and this and that, and we, we ate and everything. And then people started uh, gathering in by the pool talking. And Raleigh had just gotten his Rolex back. Um, it was a waterproof Rolex that leaked, so he had to take it in and get it fixed. Had a brand new pair of cowboy boots he had just bought. And uh, somebody <laughs> reached, he, he, Peter Ladd and his wife, and she was wearing a white jumpsuit, were standing right next to the pool talking to Raleigh, and somebody pushed her, and she pushed him, and he grabbed her so she, he wouldn't fall in the pool, and they ended up both going in the pool. So she comes out in her transparent pantsuit, <laughs> which was formerly white before she went in the water. And Raleigh came out, and his mustache was hanging all the way down to his Adam's apple. And of course, we took his guy, took his cowboy boots down, and threw them in the dryer. <laughs> yeah, I hope they, they probably shrunk a little bit. And his his Rolex leaked again, so he had to take it back. <laughs> now, these are just random stories, but uh, you got a I think it's Steve Antaveros story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was my first Major League Spring Training in 79 and I got to throw against the Cubs and I went out and I, I didn't give up a run for three innings and I was all pumped up, wanted to get off to a great start and um, the other pitcher wasn't ready yet so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go and take a shower. Roger Craig came up and he says, hey can you help us out, can you throw one more inning? And I said, absolutely. So I went out, <laughs> didn't have much luck in the fourth inning. But right beyond the center field wall was the parking lot where we all parked our cars. So I faced this first baseman, Steve Oliveros with the Cubs. And uh, he hit one so far out the center field. Uh, right off the bat, I knew it was gone. 
but since I volunteered to throw that fourth inning, and I, you know, I figured maybe they, they thought that, well, maybe he is a little tired, you know, that's why he gave up a couple runs. Anyway, I went in and took a shower, and I went out to go back to the hotel, and that ball that Steve Montevarro's hit, hit the hood of my car. <laughs> and for a big, he has a 73 Mercury Montego, that was six, six feet long, and there was a big, huge dent right in the middle of it. Well, Cecil, Cecil was just a great guy, but his nickname was Easy, because, I mean, he, he made all the plays, he was always in the right spot, but he, he they called him Easy because it looked like he did everything in slow motion, which he really didn't, he was just that smooth. And we were just talking one day, and we were talking about where we were from and this and that, and I told him I was in Warren, and I said I'm only, you know, 20 miles from Jamestown. And he lit up and he says, yeah, I played my league in 72. 1972, Cecil was here. Um, but in 82, right before I got to Milwaukee, I got traded to them actually during, after the fifth game of the World Series. Uh, Molitor, Yount, and Cooper in 82, all three of those guys all had 200 hits in 82. That's why they were the wall bangers. And then you had Ben Ogilvie and Ted Simmons and Gorman Thomas, you know, after those guys. Ben Ogilvie, he's still, I saw him just two years ago and he still looks like he could play. He doesn't even have gray hair. But he went over, he left Milwaukee, I think, went, went to maybe Detroit, went somewhere for a year then went back to Milwaukee. He hit the farthest ball ever in the Metrodome. 497 feet indoors and hit in, in left right center he's a left-handed hitter and it hit above the seats it hit off the wall right below where the roof started it was an unbelievable shot uh, all those guys were great because it was a better ball club you know and from 78 through 82 I mean they they were the finest team Probably the American League. It was a veteran ball club, and it was like a big family. You know, they, they were just a great bunch of guys. But does it ever dawn on you that on that team you had five Hall of Famers? Yeah. Hall of Fame: Molitor, Young, uh, Ted Simmons, Don Sutton, and Raleigh Fingers. Yeah, Raleigh Fingers. Yeah, five guys in the Hall of Fame. Tell me how Raleigh Fingers uh, put the mustache juice on his face. Yeah, it's funny, he just put mustache wax on both of his hands and he would just grab it, twist it, and it was done. <laughs> Been doing it for 10, 11, 12 years. But he was, he was just, he was unbelievable. But with the rule changes, they'll, they'll never be, with extra inning games now, starting with a runner on second, uh, the days of probably uh, closers with 50 saves is probably gone. I don't think it'll ever happen to you. One year, you started off like a house of fire in American League. Your ERA was really low, and then all of a sudden you came up with a guy, I think his name is Ripken. Yeah. What happened there? <laughs> well, I started uh, the 83 season. I went to Venezuela, because that was it for me. I spent four years in Hawaii. I led the PCL three of the four years. Still got sent down every year. And I uh, got traded to Milwaukee and uh, didn't know whether I was going to play or not, so I had him send me to Venezuela. I went down and got 35 innings in. We played two, winter ball for two months so I could go to spring training in mid-season four. And I uh, only gave up, I think, three runs all of spring training. And we got into the end of May. I was 3-0 and with three saves and a .8 ERA in probably 12, 15 ball games and was runner up to the American League Pitcher of the Month. Uh, Dave Steep threw two one-hitters and, and edged me out. Uh, but my ERA was .8. We go to Baltimore after, um, it was the night after I faced uh, Rod Carew and Reggie Jackson on Monday Night Baseball with Howard Cosell and Al Michaels and got a save. Next night in Baltimore, Ripken hit a three-run homer off me <laughs> and we lost the game. And we go back, can't remember who else we played. We played for another week. We went two more stops and then went back home. 
we opened with Baltimore. We got home and uh, we were up eight to one, and I came in for Sutton. And uh, Ripken hit another three run homer <laughs> on me. I didn't give up the lead though, but my ERA went from .8 to 2.4 in just a, in less than two weeks, all because of Cal Ripken. <laughs> probably weren't alone. Yeah. <laughs> so Joe, you probably have the question you want to embarrass Tom about. What would it be? Well, when we first started, when we coached together down to Warren, you know, he uh, he told me, he says, hey, listen, I played in the major leagues. I know all about that game and everything like that. But you're the man, you're the coach, and you're the man. I said, Tom, you want me to coach third base? You played in the major leagues. He said, either don't worry about that, man. He said, I played there. I didn't coach there. He <laughs> said, you, you take third base and take control of the game. He said, I got the rest of it. He said, yeah, I made, sure, I made sure that he coached third. Well, basically, it, it was daunting uh, to do everything. And he was such a great infielder, so... I, 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 and I worked with the kids a lot on, on uh, he worked with them on hitting, I worked with them on hitting, and then I took the pitchers, I always made sure, and if there was even a position player who was left-handed, I had him throw <laughs> just in case we needed him at, 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 at a later date. But uh, I, I was never, pitchers didn't hit, so I wasn't used to, to the signals. <laughs> you know, and, and he was good at it, so I said, I want you to coach third, and uh, you run the offense, and I'll make out the lineup and everything else, and I'll make sure that everybody's ready as far as pitching goes, but I said, I want you to run the offense. But as you look back and you say right there, one or two highlights and sort of things that uh, you're, you're most proud of? I can remember the first time I got called into a game and, and stood on the mound in, Yankee, in old Yankee Stadium. And I've taken my eight warm-up pitches. Toby Hare was going to be the first guy I faced. And I looked down at my feet for a second. And, and when, you, when, when, you, when you're in Yankee Stadium, especially during visitors' batting practice, on the scoreboard, they play the old biography with Mike Wallace, the black and white ones. And they've got the biography of Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth and Whitey <laughs> Ford, Joe DiMaggio. They're just flooding you with Yankee lore the whole time you're out on the field taking BP. So the game started, I come in and I can remember I was all ready to go and I looked down on my feet and the hair on my neck just stood up because I realized that Babe Ruth and Walter Johnson and Whitey Ford and, and all those guys had, had stood right where my feet were. And it was just overwhelming. It was absolutely overwhelming. I, I think the first Monday, the first Monday night ABC before baseball was on every night. There was a Saturday baseball game with uh, Kirk Downey and Joe Garagiola, and then there was the Monday night game with Al Michaels and Howard Cosell. And my folks had never seen me play. And um, the very first Monday night game, we were blowing them, the Angels out nine to two, and the Brewers had played the Angels for the ALCS the year before. Brewers beat them. Before the game, after BP, Howard Cosell and Al Michaels and Earl Weaver were standing at home plate with Harmon Killebrew, my all-time idol. Uh, Harmon was the radio, the color radio announcer for the Angels. So I go grab my pitching coach, Pat Dobson, and I said, Dobber, I said, that's, that's Harmon Killebrew. Because I used to uh, talk to Dobber about pitching to him all the time. He said he hit him as high as he hit him long. <laughs> and, and, and I said, you got to take me in and introduce me to him. And he says, he's a great guy. He said, just, just go say hello. I said, no, you can't understand. That's Harvey Killebrook. <laughs> so he took me in, and uh, I shook Howard Cosell's hand and all my goals, and, and I, I, I stole a BP ball, brand new one, took it in, and Harmon signed it to me. And uh, I got to meet him. It was an unbelievable thrill. <laughs> And then the game started. We were blowing them out 9-2. to two. Detroit Boston was the backup game in case of rain. So everybody on Warren was watching. And the game switched to the Detroit game uh, probably in the seventh inning. So everybody on Warren went to sleep because they didn't think Milwaukee game was coming back on. And Bob McClure gave up a grand slam to Ron Jackson, who played first base with the Angels, not Reggie. And all of a sudden it's nine to six, and when they switched back to I and Detroit started blowing 
uh, Boston out. So they switched back to our game, and I just uh, had thrown the first pitch. And um, I was in the game, and the thing is, it was 40 degrees, early May, and it was cold, and Harvey, Harvey Keene had a prosthesis, he had a wooden leg, and he would never call down early to let you know to get loose early. He would just call you and say you're in because it would take him three times as long to get out of there. <laughs> so I came into the game and, and I, you know, I didn't get a whole lot of warm up so I came in and got eight more, but I hadn't started to sweat yet. And first thing, I gave up a home run to Bobby Gritch right down the right field foul pole. The left field, he hit, a runner, hit it off the left field foul pole. So now it's nine to seven. And in, the, in my subconscious, I'm going, please don't let me screw up because I know my folks are watching. <laughs> and then I give up a base hit to uh, Juan Benitez. And then I threw Bob Boone such a horrible slider. He got way out in front, hit it to Robin, we turned a double play, and I'm out of the inning. <laughs> so all of our guys are in the dugout because we're now hitting. And I ran all the way up the tunnel and went into the locker room. And the uh, first thing it did was I got on my hands and knees in front of my locker. <laughs> and, and I said a few prayers to the good Lord uh, in hopes that he would see to it that I didn't embarrass myself in front of my mom and dad. I wasn't worried about the angels. I <laughs> so I knew my folks were watching. So it was amazing because I walked back down to the dugout and sat down. I might have been two outs by then. And, and miraculously, I just broke a good sweat. And when I went out in the ninth inning, everything was right there. I struck out Rod Carew, I popped up Reggie Jackson, struck out the senseis to end the game. And, um, yeah, that's, that, that was an unbelievable moment. That, that was probably the greatest one. Well, it's an unbelievable moment that you joined us today, and we have a little bit of a gift for you, Mike Metzger. Since you're such a Milwaukee fan, I happen to have this at home, amongst other stuff. But I wanted you to have, this is a Jim Gantner autographed jersey. Oh, thank you, wow. Wow, thank you so much. Wow. I'm signed it on the number. Look at there. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Thank you, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Tellman honoring Mike Metzger. And, and the next move is where they're going to throw out the first pitch. So if you hear Mike Metzger and a lot of screaming and yelling, it'll be Metzger and Tellman. So thank you very much for coming. In addition, uh, I have a few cards on Tom Tellman, baseball cards that were blown up. So. He'd be happy, I think, to autograph them for you. So here they are. So don't be shy. 